Hi, and welcome to The Public's Health, a product of the Alameda County Public Health Department. I'm Dr. Tony Eiten, the Director of the Public Health Department, and this show is an attempt to put you, the public, back into public health. We've got two really interesting subjects today. We're going to talk about HIV testing and some of the advances that have been made in testing and Alameda County's effort to expand HIV testing throughout the entire county to make it normal to have your HIV status known for every Alameda County resident. We're going to show you some public service announcement, announcements that we've created, as well as we're going to talk to um, a Dr. Dan O'Brien from um, a leading HIV treatment center in Alameda County, as well as we're going to talk to you, people on the street, and get your sense of what's known about HIV testing, how available it is, and how it's used. We're also going to talk to uh, Dr. Jim Pointer, who's with me in the studio today, and he's our medical director for our Emergency Medical Services Agency. And Jim is going to tell us about heat emergencies, as well as um, take us through some of the structure and function of the Alameda County EMS Agency. Now, we hope to um, be able to get all of this into one show, and we expect that um, this will be interesting, informative, and exciting for you. We're joined by an expert from the East Bay AIDS Center at Alta Bates Summit Medical Center, Dr. Steve O'Brien. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Eitan. So HIV AIDS has changed a lot since the early 1980s when we first became acquainted with the disease. Help us understand the, the basic uh, process of infection. Well, the HIV disease is the same, but it's manifesting itself differently. When you first get infected, if I were to go out and be infected today, the virus would slowly grow and rise in my system over a period of several weeks. And then after a period of six to eight weeks, my blood test, my HIV test, would become positive for the first time. Mm. But I could remain asymptomatic for many years, on average up to 10 years before you ever manifest with symptoms of HIV disease, wow, by which time your years. immune system's very, um, very denigrated. So I could feel good for 10 years, not knowing that I have the virus inside of me, and only after 10 or so years would I start to show any symptoms, medical or clinical symptoms of the disease. That's exactly right. And that's one of the major problems with HIV, is that many of the people who have it don't know that they have it because they have no symptoms. And yet, because they don't know they have it, they're at risk for spreading it to others. So how are you at the East Bay AIDS Center? Um, how has the way you approach HIV changed over the years? Well, the East Bay AIDS Center at Alta Bates Summit Medical Center, we're the largest HIV clinic in the East Bay, currently serving 1,300 people living with HIV AIDS. We started as a small program in 1986 that served mainly gay men, and at that time, mainly white gay men. But over time, our clinic has grown significantly, and now we serve predominantly African Americans. A third of our patients are women. Many people are surprised by that, but the epidemic is not just a gay man's disease anymore. It really is progressing into the general community. And particularly in communities like ours, which are very diverse, African Americans are at an increased risk. So you mentioned that people can uh, be infected and not know it. And the consequence of that is when they come to see you, are they in worse shape than you might have hoped? Over half of the new HIV diagnosis that present at our clinic present when they're at very advanced disease, usually when they have an opportunistic infection. Mm. And unfortunately, at that time, it's harder to treat people. The risk of dying is worse. The risk of benefiting from med medicines is worse. And that's too bad, because the great news is there's terrific treatments for HIV now, and nobody needs to be suffering with opportunistic infections. So we want people to get tested. We want people to know their status. Is that the message that you're giving your patients in the community when you're talking to them? People deserve to know. You deserve, you have a right to know. You have a right to have a mammogram, a prostate exam. It's part of your normal health screening process. Get an HIV test because God forbid you're HIV positive, but guess what? There's great treatments now. There's great things we can do to keep you healthy. And most people who get diagnosed now early with HIV can live hopefully a normal lifespan. Well, 
We're going to show some um, public service announcements that we've developed to get this message out around HIV, and we hope that uh, you'll enjoy them. And then we're going to come back with Dr. O'Brien, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the barriers that people face in the community around HIV testing. Now, things have changed a lot in HIV. This is a complicated disease. This is a complicated um, situation. So we want to make sure that people understand that there are some basic things that you can know about your own health and that you deserve to think about getting tested easily. Uh, Alta Bates and the East Bay AIDS Center has created opportunities for people to get treatment when they need it, and the county has worked on all kinds of opportunities for expanding um, access to treatment. So now we're going to go to some interesting PSAs. You make healthy choices every day. I wear a helmet. I eat fruits and vegetables. I wear a seatbelt. And you get tested for HIV and share the results with your partner. Right? What about you? And you? Make learning your HIV status one of your healthy choices. Get an HIV screening test. It's time for the video classroom math quiz. Our students are already working on this question. If a million Americans have HIV and only three-fourths of them know their HIV status, how many people could be affected by HIV without knowing it? Do the math. One HIV screening test plus 20 minutes equals your HIV status. Know your status. And then connect with a healthcare professional if you need to. Welcome back to Dig This. Today's couple has been digging for 20 minutes now. Let's see how they're doing. Ow. Ow. Are you okay, honey? Ow, blisters! Ow. How's your back? I'm okay. Keep the egg! Right. Something's here. Yes. The results yes. of our HIV status. Get real. Learn your status in 20 minutes with an HIV screening test. And talk about it with your partner. Get tested. We're interested in your feedback on these. If you have opinions or ideas, look at the uh, website that we're going to post at the end of the show and the phone number and call us and tell us what you think. They raised some interesting issues around the epidemic in Alameda County and in the state as a whole and, and certainly as a nation. We're trying to be as creative as possible to get the message out about people knowing their status. Everybody should know their status. Dr. O'Brien, what are some of the issues that you see that are barriers to people getting tested? I think a couple of big barriers. One is people don't think that they're at risk. They think, oh, those are the type of people who get HIV. I'm not at risk. But there are more and more heterosexuals who are getting HIV, mm -hmm. more and more people of color who are getting HIV, more and more people who have no previous known risk factor other than to having been sexually active. So that's why the CDC recommends everybody between the age of 13 and 64 get screened at least once for HIV. And if you have ongoing risk factors, get screened annually. And the best way you can do that, ask your doctor for an HIV test. When you're going in for your normal exam, ask for an HIV test. Three weeks, four weeks. Maybe a day or so, I think. Two weeks. It's been about two weeks waiting period. I think about a day. I don't think I've been tested for HIV, actually. I felt like I was pretty safe. Okay. I didn't really feel that nervous about it. I was kind of, kind of, kind of anxious, kind of jumpy to figure, find out the results. Safe. I did mine. I mean, as long as they were coming. I don't like having my blood drawn in general, but um, I thought that that was necessary. I'm okay with having my blood drawn. I guess I had to do that for um, testing my blood sugar and stuff like that. So I mean, it, it's okay. The needle, the needles are too big, you know, and they and they take two tubes from you. So yeah, it's a lot of blood. I don't mind getting, I mean, needles, I don't too have too much of a problem with needles, so. Uh, I don't like the feeling of needles. Just, I guess, a regular procedure that, you know, that health people have to do 
in order to take a HIV test? Because I don't like being poked. I don't like uh, uh, seeing my own blood. I don't like the sensation of having blood pulled out. I mean, what if you miss a vein, you know? So I think there, there are some risks with needles and they're very discomforting. A lot of people are afraid of needles and getting their blood drawn, so I think that would help a lot. That's good. I mean, the sooner the better. I mean, you know, I think, I think it's, you know, it's a necessary thing in society right now, and, and, and so the fa you know, less pain results, I think it's wonderful. Oh yeah, definitely. I would think that it would improve the rates of testing. It sounds like it's easier and less painful and I don't feel that it might be as accurate perhaps because you know I guess HIV has to do with your blood system or something with um, you know catching it through the bloodline or something like that so I, I would probably feel a lot more precise getting a blood drawn test but you know um, I guess the swab test I mean I, I guess it wouldn't hurt to try for anybody you know who was getting tested. I, I mean, I definitely like that, but outside of having some DNA concerns about, you know, what they're going to do with the, uh, I think it's good. I mean, it's not, obviously it's not as painful, um, and I think the risks are lower, and uh, it's fast. And what about issues of confidentiality? Some people don't necessarily want to ask their doctor. They may want to get tested somewhere where their doctor may not know because they're concerned about, you know, discrimination. And that's a legitimate concern. First of all, there's nothing wrong with being HIV positive, but clearly people do have issues of confidentiality. And the great thing about Alameda County is they have made terrific resources available. There are confidential and anonymous testing sites. You can look up on the web at www.hivtest.com. Mm -hmm. and put in your zip code and they'll put HIV testing sites near you that you and they'll list whether they're confidential or whether they're anonymous so there are alternatives and the HIV test itself can be done with an oral swab that not, doesn't even require a needle stick and how quick can you get results from that within 20 minutes just like a rapid strep test or a rapid pregnancy test wow. it's very quick and easy wow that's exciting so people can literally go in get a swab and within 20 minutes know their HIV status that's exactly right. If somebody were to test positive with that, there's obviously confirmatory tests to make sure. Mm -hmm. And the other great thing about Alameda County, not only at the East Bay AIDS Center, but at terrific programs at Alameda County Medical Center and other programs, there's care available. So whether you have insurance or you don't have insurance, there's care and medications available to anybody who needs them in Alameda County. So why don't we have this at every barber shop, at the, in the, at the gas station, at the post office? I mean, is it an issue of people being able to find places to get tested? Or why isn't everybody getting tested? Well, from your lips to God's ears, I think you're exactly right. That's what should happen. And fortunately, Mayor Ron Dellums has taken this, this topic on. He has a long history of service to the HIV AIDS community. And he thinks that everybody in Oakland deserves to be screened. Mm -hmm. So there are programs that are working out. We're writing a grant for the CDC to try and increase testing in Alameda County. but. Part of it is related to cost. The test costs some money. There's been donations and there's foundations that are giving money to help increase the testing opportunities. But hopefully that will be the case. Just like there's blood pressure screening available at Walgreens, you put your arm in the machine, hopefully that will be available at HIV testing over time. And there's a possibility the FDA may approve actually a home HIV test. That's not yet approved, but that's in front of the FDA right now. Wow, well that certainly would make it much more accessible. Let me ask you a little bit about treatment now. You're, you're an expert in treating people. You see some thousands of patients through your clinic every year. Now, I, God forbid I test positive, and I didn't know that before. And as you said earlier, somewhere between a third and a quarter of people who are walking around Alameda County today who are positive don't know it. So now I test positive, and I come to see you in your clinic. And I'm relatively early on in my infection. I, I've picked it up relatively early. What kinds of suggestions do you have for me? 
Well, first of all, just because you test HIV positive does not necessarily need, you, need, you may not need medications. So we check your immune system, we check how much virus you have in your system, and we individualize each treatment program to the individual. There's not a general program. You as an individual get specific therapy that's best for you if you need it. And if you don't need therapy now, then you need monitoring, and that's also available. The other things available at all of the programs is counseling on how to reduce your risks of transmitting the virus. Because of all the new infections, of the 40,000 new infections in this country every year, the vast majority come from other people who do not know they have the HIV virus. Mm. Because most people are very responsible. When they know they have HIV, they take precautions to decrease the risk of transmitting to others. Now, if I start medicines these days, I've heard a lot about the new regimens for medicine. Some of them sound very complicated. You have to get up in the middle of the night to take pills. At least that's the way it used to be. Has that changed? Thanks for pointing that out. It's absolutely changed. Most regimens are once a day now. There's one regimen that is one pill once a day. And there's several regimens that are just a few pills once a day. So most of the regimens now, very well tolerated, very easy to take. So if you need drugs, you can, you can rest assured the drugs will be fit to you as an individual, something easy to take that you can fit into your lifestyle. What if I don't have any money and I need these drugs? How, how do I get them? Well, your tax dollars and my tax dollars and people's tax dollars around the community are going to pay for programs that make drugs available to every single person. And at the treatment programs, at the East Bay AIDS Center, at Alameda County Medical Center, there's social workers who can help you get onto the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, funded by Ryan White, to Medi-Cal if you, if you qualify for Medi-Cal. And there's other programs that are available that help people access medications. We have nobody who needs medications who cannot access them. Everybody has some way of accessing medications, and we're experts at helping people get that. Well, Dr. O'Brien, you're quite the expert. We're so pleased to have you here, and we're so pleased to have the East Bay AIDS Center in our county doing such great work, taking care of our people. From Dr. Steve O'Brien on HIV AIDS to Dr. Jim Pointer on heat emergency. Jim, welcome to the show. You're the EMS medical director. Tell us what you do. Well, thanks for having me on the show, uh, Tony. Um, as medical director for emergency medical services, I am responsible for the training, quality improvement, and basically the tracking of our system. And our system includes uh, 12 fire departments and a private ambulance provider. This system allows any citizen in the county, without regard to uh, payer source, uh, to access an ambulance for any type of emergency with subsequent transport to a hospital. That's great. So that's a pretty, pretty uh, large job and large responsibility that you have there. So let's talk about heat emergencies. You train emergency medical technicians and paramedics around a whole bunch of different protocols for uh, emergency situations. Tell us about heat emergencies. What, are the, what does the public need to know about heat emergencies? It's very important that our public is informed uh, so that uh, heat emergencies can be avoided. In fact, all heat emergencies are preventable. Uh, heat emergencies run the gamut, a continuum from very minor emergencies all the way through uh, uh, what's, uh, what's known as uh, uh, heat stroke. Uh, the minor emergencies probably everyone has encountered, and they include uh, cramps, uh, fainting spells from heat, uh, and the development of swelling or edema in the lower extremities. And this is all caused by the redistribution of uh, blood uh, in the body as a result of the body's uh, efforts to uh, literally fight off the heat. I want to focus a little on heat exhaustion and heat stroke because they're more serious and they're more important to prevent. Uh, heat exhaustion, uh, the symptoms involve uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, pain in the muscles, uh, oftentimes uh, fainting spells, the feeling of fatigue, and maybe the inability to sort of get thoughts straight. Uh, the temperature, the body temperature, rarely goes over about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and most cases are fairly preventable. Uh, in fact, uh, 
the viewers may have a friend or may have indeed experienced personally uh, the beginnings of heat exhaustion and just uh, removing oneself from the environment, uh, a, a tepid shower and the administration of, of fluids is generally all that's needed. For heat stroke, a much more serious uh, condition, there are two uh, varieties, exertional heat stroke and then what's known as the classic heat stroke. And I think uh, the classic heat stroke is more relevant to most of us because uh, exertional heat stroke usually occurs in outdoor workers or in athletes. Which we're going to talk about in this next segment with uh, Jim Morrissey. Quickly summarize heat stroke for us before we go to the Roland. Uh, the, the classic uh, symptoms of heat stroke uh, all involve uh, a derangement of the central nervous system. Uh, hallucinations, coma, uh, literal delirium can all occur and indeed you cannot make that diagnosis of heat stroke uh, without those symptoms. In addition, our bodies uh, literally start to fall apart because the heat uh, denatures some of the proteins and there are signs and symptoms of liver failure, kidney failure, and the ability of the blood uh, to clot properly. Wow, well, now that's pretty serious stuff. Let's go to uh, the roll-in with Jim Morrissey and then come back and, and talk a little bit more. Hi, my name is Jim Morrissey and I'm a paramedic with Alameda County Emergency Medical Services. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about heat-related illnesses, especially as they pertain to people working or exercising or athletics in the outdoors. Uh, today we're out in Dublin, California at the Sheriff's Department training range and uh, there are a number of people out here training as you can see in the background. And as you can appreciate, Dublin can be quite a bit hotter than we experience in Oakland or other places in the East Bay. Any significant event you have on a calendar, plan at least one month ahead of time to get yourself not only in good shape, but to acclimatize to the heat. Now, during the hot environment, there are some critically important things. You know, a human exercising, as we just saw there, is generating heat. Heat, in many ways, is a, is a waste product. It's much like the CO2 that we breathe. So we have to be able to get rid of heat. And our body has ways of doing that quite effectively. We send blood to our skin, we also sweat. And sweating is an incredibly effective way of keeping our body cool. But as I hope you can appreciate, when you're sweating, you're losing water. Now you'd think that you could just drink water and that would be okay. But as you all know from tasting your sweat, there's a fair amount of salt in there. So there has to be a balance of both fluid intake and also electrolyte intake, and that's basically salt. Watch for the early signs of heat illness. And the real simple message there is that if somebody is nauseous and they feel dizzy, especially when they stand up or go from laying down to upright and it's a hot environment, almost guaranteed that that's heat exhaustion. The solution to that is pretty straightforward. Stop the exercise, get them out of the heat environment, and then just slowly replace the fluids and electrolytes that they've lost. There is a serious concern and that's called heat stroke. Heat stroke is very simply one's body's core temperature is screaming to life-threatening levels. And for an outdoor athlete, they're basically producing more heat than their body can dump. So I think you can appreciate if someone were exercising very, very rigorously and it's 95 degrees and high humidity, they can be sweating all they want, but their core temperature may in fact go up to dangerous levels. So the indicators for heat stroke are really a significant altered mental status. Somebody hallucinating, staggering, not able to walk a straight line, even collapsing, and worse yet, even developing full seizure activity in a hot environment. That is a life-threatening emergency which needs rapid intervention. Whatever you can do in the field, of course call 911, have them on way, but whatever you can do to cool them down right there on the spot may save their life. If you can just sprinkle water on them and fan them, that's better than nothing. Better yet, get them into a cold shower, certainly out of the environment. So in summary, heat exhaustion, inconvenient, stop, fix, heat stroke, life-threatening, you have to treat it right then and there. Thank you. Okay, so we've talked about three different types of heat emergencies, ranging from the mild to the quite severe, with seizures and death being a possible consequence. Jim, who's most vulnerable to these kinds of consequences in a heat uh, emergency? Well, as you might expect, uh, those patients that are shut in 
those that are elderly, uh, particularly the elderly that have uh, chronic illnesses, uh, those that use alcohol, and then there are certain medications that can increase susceptibility to heat stroke, and they include medications used for depression, phenothiazines, even uh, aspirin, uh, antihistamines, and beta blockers, uh, drugs that can be used for high blood pressure. That's a lot of medicines and pretty common medicines from my experience practicing. Now, how do we prevent this? What are some good steps that people can take to try to avoid these kinds of consequences? Well, as I said earlier, every case of, of heat illness is preventable. And it actually, uh, regardless, regardless of income, uh, there are steps that our citizens can take. Uh, one easy step is during, uh, during a, a period of time in the summer when there are very, very hot days to take frequent showers. And they need not be cold, just room temperature water is fine. Uh, this, this method is very effective at uh, lowering the body's temperature. Regular uh, ingestion of fluids is a very good way uh, to maintain the body's uh, uh, regulation of heat. And a rule of thumb would be to use one of the sports drinks, uh, like Gatorade, but to dilute it, because most of those sports drinks have a little bit too much sugar uh, that is needed to uh, maintain a regulation of heat. Fans are very effective, uh, a very effective method. And just everyday clothing, to ensure that our clothing is not too tight, but is loose fitting. Great, that's really good advice. Thanks very much, Dr. Pointer. I want to thank my other guest, Dr. Steve O'Brien. We've learned a lot today, important stuff. Alameda County is on your side, working for you to improve the public's health and to keep you and the rest of us living long and healthy lives. See you next time.